Chapter 17 The Forgotten Way Two days later they were high in the Cephid Cow Mountain Range, heading through the so-called Forgotten Way toward Pakistan. The truck was surprisingly hardy, making its way through the tight switchbacks and steep inclines with little difficulty. It took X a while to get used to the bumpy ride. It was like being an old sneaker bounced about in a dryer. The pass constantly twisted and turned, arbitrarily cut through the mountain by nature. The thirty-foot cliffs on either side of the pass were seemingly impossible to scale. X thought of the countless other men on secret missions who must have passed this way over the centuries, Persians, Mongols, Tartars, Huns, Turks, British, and Russian spies in the Crimean War. The identity thief imagined soldiers of Genghis Khan, high above them on the cliffs, staging an ambush, raining arrows down on the road. Soviet troops had hunted Afghani freedom fighters here. Drug dealers and smugglers had sneaked through with their illicit wares. And now this motley crew of liars, terrorist hunters pretending to be terrorists, pretending to be carpet merchants. They drove until sundown, when the sparse vegetation lining the road became slowly invisible. As darkness fell, it became increasingly difficult to make out the canyon walls on either side of the trail. There was a half-moon, but the light was obscured by a dense cloud cover. Clearly they could go no farther. They made camp on the side of the road. Their benefactors in Cardez had supplied them with two Russian-era tents, presumably snatched from the invaders long ago, one to accommodate Tracy, the other for the three men. The trio had to crowd in so close, X found his comrade's body odor unbearable. His wasn't any better, he supposed. None of them had bathed for days, not since a sponge bath by a nurse in the prison hospital. X was about a hundred and fifty feet from camp, when Harry caught up with him. "'Where the hell do you think you're going?' the computer ace demanded. "'I'm not going anywhere. I'm having a smoke,' X replied. He took the pack of Turkish cigarettes from his pocket and held them up. Bullshit, Harry hissed. You're headed back to Gardez, aren't you? Don't be ridiculous, X said. Do you have any idea how far that is? Don't get any ideas about going AWOL, Harry snarled. There's a tracking device planted in your body. We can track you down anywhere in the Middle East. You're full of shit. Where? None of your business where. I'm not going to tell you so you can pull it out. X remembered the filling Mr. Jones had so generously replaced. Nice information to keep under his cap. Harry strode to him and jabbed his finger in his chest. Listen, asswipe, I don't like you, and I don't trust you. As far as I'm concerned, you're a cowardly, sniveling piece of shit. If it wouldn't jeopardize the mission, I'd shoot you right now. I'm hurt you feel that way, X said, because I really like you. What is going on? They turned and saw Asar, who stood nearby, scratching his balls. Uh, n nothing, Harry said. I heard you arguing, the teen insisted. Harry shook his head, trying to appear clueless. X leapt in. It is just a disagreement between friends, he said. The wrath of brothers is fierce and devilish. Asar looked from face to face, concerned. Beware that you do not utter words you'll regret, for it is also said that the wound of words is worse than the wound of a knife. The two men nodded somberly. Let us embrace, X said. He grabbed Harry in a beer hug, and the spy did an impressive job of faking enthusiasm as he returned the embrace. The trio returned to the campsite, Asar entertaining them with a traditional Afghani song as they made their way through the dimly lit canyon, the crescent moon over their heads. The first bandit X spotted was the one holding Tracy in a chokehold. The seven others came from behind them, Kalishnikovs pointed at their heads. "'On your knees!' barked a tall, gaunt man with a scar stretching from his right eye to his top lip. Harry and X dropped to their knees, and a bandit stood behind each of them, 
rifles pointed to their heads. Asar hesitated. An impatient six-foot-four thug grabbed him by the nape of the neck and forced his face into the dirt. "'Search the truck,' said Scarface, whom X took to be the leader. Three of the highwaymen held the trio in place, while four others searched the truck. With the captive subdued, the leader strutted back and forth, like a rooster, newly crowned king of the barnyard. You know you need permission to pass through these mountains. You camp a stone's throw from our base? We will have to teach you respect. We are but simple carpet merchants on our way home to Pakistan, X offered. This is my brother and his wife and our nephew. We know we have to pay a bribe to pass this way. Here, in my pocket. The man guarding X dug greedily into his pocket and yanked out the bag. He poured the gems into his hand and whistled. There must be a thousand dollars worth here, he gasped. Harry shot X a dirty look. How is that smoke, Aban? he asked. Here, said the leader. His henchman, somewhat reluctantly, tossed the bag over. Tracy had been rousted from a deep sleep by the bandits about five minutes before X and the others returned to the camp. She was clad in a white cotton slip that fell nearly to her knees, supremely modest by Western standards, but still felt nearly nude without the veil and heavy garb she'd become accustomed to over the past several days. The guy guarding Tracy held her in the chokehold, very close. To her disgust, she became aware that he'd sprouted an erection, which was now lewdly poking her backside. The men searching the back of the truck tossed out the carpets and soon found the Kalishnikovs, the AK-47s, the grenades, and the rocket launcher. "'You still claim you are merchants,' Scarface said with obvious amusement. "'Opium traffickers, more likely. Where is your stash? Are you going to tell us, or do we have to start checking bungholes?' We are in the service of the warriors of Allah, Asar blurted. I am the personal driver of the chief, Harry added. If you are enemies of the Americans, you should aid us. Well, you see, I am not very political, Scarface informed them. I prefer sports. Did you see the game between New Zealand and Brazil? The satellite reception is not very good here in the mountains, but we saw the second half. A great game. His men laughed. You're a Tajik, Harry said, and that one is a Pushtan. I am a Saudi. But we all have a part in the struggle. You fools want to be martyrs, don't you, and receive your seventy-seven virgins, Scarface said, then spat contemptuously. You will have your chance to bed your heavenly harem shortly. The appeal to religious solidarity didn't seem to be working all that well, but Harry carried on, undeterred. "'You cannot frighten us. Being killed in the service of Allah is a great honor," he said. "'The Prophet tells us, I wish to fight for Allah's cause and be killed. I'll do it again and be killed, and I'll do it again and be killed. We yearn for this kind of death, as much as you yearn to live.' Scarface bowed. I am glad to be of service, then. I would be happy to grant you your fondest wish. But first, you'll tell us where the cash is. I know they sent you with some American money in addition to the diamonds. One of the men jumped off the truck. Look what I found, he said, excitedly holding up Harry's laptop. One of the others leaned over his shoulder and whistled. It's a beauty! Harry tried to struggle to his feet and was promptly shoved back down. That laptop was critical to the mission. "'Be careful with that!' he shouted. "'What is this for?' the leader demanded. "'Video games,' X said. Scarface laughed. "'You have a good sense of humor. I'll kill you last.' "'We use it to communicate with the chief,' Harry explained. "'Thank you for the gift. Scarface said, waving the laptop. He winked at X. I am partial to Grand Theft Auto myself. Meanwhile, the man holding Tracy continued to take liberties. He put his right hand on her breast and began to squeeze it, 
as if he were testing a tomato for ripeness. "'You are their leader,' Tracy said to Scarface. "'Are you going to let a good Muslim woman be molested by this son of a pig?' "'As I said, you people must learn respect,' Scarface replied. "'And the first lesson will be how to treat a woman. "'I am certain your husband will learn a lot from watching us.' Now having been given the green light so explicitly by his leader, the bandit restraining Tracy grew bolder. He stuck his hand between the agent's legs and began groping her. "'Don't worry. You'll have her back when we're done with her,' Scarface told Harry. "'And there are only eight of us.' "'Do you not fear the wrath of Allah?' Asar cried. Scarface knelt beside the teen. I am sure that you are a religious man and will do your duty. You will obey Sharia, your holy law, and stone your sister-in-law to death for her sin of adultery. Asar struggled in fury, but his huge guardian had him firmly by the neck. Another bandit, a dwarf no taller than three feet, climbed off the truck with a box of cash. Got it, he shouted. Count it. Scarface commanded. The little man opened the box and began to count. One hundred? Two hundred? Three hundred? X thought back to the dwarf who worked as a barker for the Pink Panther. This fellow was even shorter, he thought. The man behind Tracy slid his rough, calloused hand up under her skirt and began stroking her inner thigh. She gasped as his middle finger entered her. Don't be afraid he murmured in her ear. We won't kill you, just the others. I am probably a lot bigger than your little husband, but I will be slow and gentle with you. Six hundred, seven hundred, eight hundred, the pint-sized henchman was counting. Nine hundred. <laughs> Next week, we'll eat steak at the finest restaurant in Kabul, my friends, the bandit leader exclaimed in delight, and be entertained by the best whores in town. He glanced at Tracy, and as if loath to give offense, bowed and corrected himself. I mean, belly dancers. Listen, X said, I am Ali Nazaire, a vowed operative of the Jihadist Brotherhood. Deliver us to the chief, and he will reward you handsomely. Scarface's jaw dropped. Hey, we saw a story about this guy on CNN, one of his men said. I remember. Well, well, well. This casts a new light on things. What do you mean by handsomely? We are close allies. I am sure he would pay a million for my safe return. The bandits began to chatter excitedly. An interesting proposal, Scarface said. I wonder how much the Americans would pay. Perhaps more, X said. But you want to be known in these mountains as the man who collaborated with the Americans and turned over their worst enemy to them? Scarface stroked his chin thoughtfully. A few feet away, the bandit's thick, dirty finger was stroking in and out of Tracy, very rapidly and very deep. Her breath became heavy. It was the first time she'd been touched by a man down there in over a year. You feel me behind you, he whispered, thrusting forward for emphasis. It was a stupid question, because the guy was hung like a donkey. Slowly she began to rotate her ample behind against him. He gave a grunt of satisfaction. "'I'm going to show you how a Pashtun makes love to a woman,' Don Kedek whispered. "'How you will cry out with pleasure when I split you in half.' Tracy reached under her slip and placed her hand firmly on his, sinking her nails into his flesh. She moaned audibly. "'She loves it,' her captor announced to his associates. She's wet as a dog in a pond. The bandits began to chortle. A sar roared in fury. Get your hands off her, you pigs. Allah will see that you all burn in the fires of hell. The man holding him by the nape of the neck shook him with a loud guffaw. It is your own tight little ass you have to worry about, pretty boy. We'll make a woman of you next. It was hard to tell whether this was mere taunting or the big bruiser truly had libidinous intent. In any event, the teen's eyes widened in horror. X squinted for a better look at Tracy and saw that tears were running down her cheeks, which were bright red. Come on, was this 
uptight FBI agent really getting turned on by the touch of some hairy, one-eyebrowed thug. He'd sensed it had been a long time since she'd gotten laid, but still, he thought. I'd always suspected you had a freak flag, doll, but what a time to fly it. The bandit leader strutted over to Harry and patted him on the shoulder. It looks like you've married a true slut, my friend, he told the kneeling man. You haven't been taking care of things at home, eh? Don't worry, we'll handle it from here. Harry turned away, as if refusing to witness his wife's debasement. Scarface stepped toward Tracy, the woman whose hand was lost under her dress, caressing her captive's hairy wrist, bowed her head in shame. Scarface tipped up her chin to look her in the eyes. "'Are you ready, sweet flower?' Scarface asked, grinning and grabbing his crotch like a gangster rapper. "'You know, the leader's turn is always first. "'I'm ready,' she whispered. "'And you will be first. The agent pulled the Beretta from its holster strapped to her inner thigh and came up firing. She put the first round in Scarface's heart. With the next five shots, she dropped four of the other bandits, each a perfect forehead shot, and winged the one holding a sar in the shoulder. The big guy was the only one who got even a chance to scream, scrambling to his feet and racing down the road like a jackrabbit. When she'd emptied the gun, she flipped Donkey Dick over her shoulder, and as soon as he crashed into the ground, she bought the butt of the weapon swooping down to cave in his skull. Harry sank his teeth into the hand of the bandit holding him. As the guy released his hold, the agent executed a textbook judo flip of his own and then expertly twisted the bandit's neck until it snapped with a sickening crack. The man holding X keeled over dead, Tracy's bullet in his right eye socket. All this took place in the space of less than five seconds. Nice performance, X whispered to Tracy, standing and brushing dust off his knees. How will I ever know if you're faking it? He is getting away, Harry said, pointing to the wounded bandit. Asar scrambled on the ground for gun. I will send that sodomite to hell, he cried. Tracy coolly picked up the rocket launcher and aimed it at the cliff which the sole surviving bandit was desperately trying to scale about twenty yards away. She released the firing mechanism, and the missile took off. A second later there was an explosion in the distance, and nothing was left of the bandit but smoke. Asar, kneeling, looked up at her in amazement. "'You are a goddess!' the teen gasped reverently. X stepped behind her and whispered, "'Very Sylvester Stallone of you.' They found the bandit's hideout less than three hundred yards away. The mouth of the cave was about halfway up a steep incline concealed by bushes. If it hadn't been for an empty vodka bottle left at the foot of the slope, they would never have seen it. After a short passage, they had to hunch over to squeeze through. The mouth opened up into a huge cavern with a span of more than two hundred feet. At the back wall of the cave, a trickle of water flowed down the rocks and dribbled into a little black pool. Their flashlights revealed dozens of carvings, pictograms recounting a forgotten battle waged countless eons ago. Searching the bandits' doors, they found some American-made weapons, an Uzi, and crates filled with plastic-wrapped bundles of opium. Roped in a stall, were eight donkeys. Allah is merciful. We can use the animals from here on, Asar said. The terrain is becoming difficult to transverse by truck. We would have had to continue on foot. Next the team came across a box chock full of pornography that seemed to have originated in India. Bare-breasted, brown-skinned girls with diamond studs decorating their noses leered into the camera as they shed their saris. Asar's eyes bulged. X had the distinct feeling he'd never seen a topless woman before, let alone one naked with her legs akimbo. Harry took the box from him. We should burn this trash immediately. 
Asar looked mournfully at the stack of porn, then nodded. We must not let our hearts be contaminated by such filth. I will take first watch, X said. He sat close to the entrance, a Klishnikov on his knee, positioned so that he could put a shot in the head of the first uninvited visitor. Of course, he'd never fired a gun in his life. He hadn't even carried one. Con men who did so were a disgrace to the profession in his view. Hadn't thrown a punch since seventh grade, for that matter. Some boy had said something about his mother. What had he called her? Tracy settled down beside him, still wearing her face piece. I thought you were asleep. Harry told me you tried to escape last night. That's an exaggeration, he replied. I was taking a walk. A long one. She shook her head. I don't get you. Don't you care about your country? Don't you care about anything other than yourself? If the chief gets his hands on a nuke, millions of Americans could die. Innocent children in New York, in Los Angeles, in Kansas could be incinerated. I guess I'm lucky I'm over here then. Why are you so goddamn selfish? Because I'm a criminal. That's no explanation. What, you want my life story now? I want to understand. Explain it to me like I'm a three-year-old. X sighed. He stood up and leaned the gun against the rock. I've been on my own since I was fourteen. That was the day my mother offed herself with sleeping pills. I never knew my father. He was some rich bastard who seduced mother when she was working in his house, scrubbing his toilets. She never told me his name. I did know he was a big shot in the United States government. So do I say a pledge of allegiance to Uncle Sam every morning? No. Tracy had read about the suicide in his file. She could see in him the lost boy who'd just been told he'd never see his mother again. She stood up beside X and touched his hand gently. Robbing every rich man in America won't bring your mother back, she said. Keep my mother out of this, he said, pulling away from her. He cursed himself for bringing mother up. He'd never told this story to anyone, not a social worker, not a foster parent. And there's more to a man's identity than bearing his father's name, Tracy went on. You can define yourself by your actions. He stared at her fiercely, nostrils flaring, then his face relaxed, and he laughed. Are you one of those women who feel they have to save a man, save his soul? he demanded. Are you some kind of missionary now? He smirked. Or are you more interested in the missionary position? Is that it? That's it, isn't it? You want me to fall in love with, or maybe just bone you? Gosh, did that little finger-fuck session get you that hot and bothered, honey? I know it's been a while, but try to keep in your pants, for God's sake. Q needs to equip you girl spies with pens that turn into vibrators or something. Tracy snorted. Don't flatter yourself, sugar. My flavor is chocolate. Really, he said. Well, then why are you blushing? I don't blush, she said. He tore away her veil, and sure enough, her face was flushed. You, you stinking arrogant, she stammered. He grabbed her waist, pulled her close, and planted his lips on hers. She pushed him away, but not far. Stop, Tracy protested weakly. He kissed her again, more aggressively now, and her bosom pressed up against his chest. This is crazy, her robust superego lectured her. But it had been so, so long since she'd been with a man or been kissed by a man, beyond a perfunctory peck on the cheek at the end of a first and last date, or, for that matter, had even been touched by a man except in a judo hold. He pulled away and gave a mischievous grin. How do you know I'm not a brother, by the way? Yeah, right. Well, maybe part, and I'll be happy to show you which part. Hush your mouth. It seemed like he was going to ruin the moment with more banter, but she used her mouth to shut him up. She slid her tongue into his mouth and wrapped it around his. Her hands found his shoulder blades and pulled him toward her so that their groins ground together. She could feel him becoming aroused. 
What the hell do you think you're doing? Harry's voice startled them. They broke apart like high school juniors caught necking in the janitor's closet by the principal. What kind of woman are you that you would throw yourself at this man so shamelessly, he snarled. Cover your face. You're really staying in character as an uptight prick, remarked X, unflustered. Are you a method actor? Harry railed on as if the other man were invisible. You're jeopardizing the mission. Asar is thirty feet away. Tracy was too embarrassed to utter a word in her own defense, but X came to the rescue. Is that you talking or the green-eyed god? X suggested, casually picking up the rifle and resting it on his shoulder. Don't be absurd. I have a wife and three children. Methinks the gentleman protests too much, said X. It looks like we have a love triangle on our hands. Tracy could barely resist a titter. The situation was like something out of high school, and Harry couldn't sound more jealous if he tried. Please don't fight over me, boys, she said. Don't flatter yourself, Harry said angrily, and his expression changed as if he regretted his choice of words. I knew Jones was crazy to send a breast-fed cherry on a mission this delicate. Excuse me? Tracy snarled, facing off with him. Breastfed, as Tracy knew only too well, was spy slang for a female FBI agent. You heard me. I'll kick your puny unibrow ass from here back to Lebanon. That'll be the day. She stepped close enough to feel his panting breath against her face. Listen, John Wayne, I'm leading this mission until the minute I'm killed or captured, so you will address me at all times with respect. Harry stepped back. Respect yourself, he mumbled. Sobering words. She had indeed allowed herself to be flattered, to enjoy the sense that she was the object of desire, like a doe contested over by two smitten bucks. It was time to reassert her authority. Let's call it a night, she said brusquely. I'll take watch. She jerked the rifle out of X's hands. Back in the body of the cavern, Wrapped in a blanket beside the still-snoring Asar, X couldn't believe what had just happened. He had never revealed so much of himself to anyone. His imprisonment had weakened him, he felt. He replayed the entire episode in his mind. He certainly hadn't intended to kiss Tracy. He had acted on impulse, something he rarely did. He'd done it to punish her, to unseat her from her high horse, prove that she was no better than him. And it was indeed smug satisfaction he primarily felt as she surrendered to his kiss. At first, then as she responded so aggressively and she'd gotten him aroused, well, he felt something else. He remembered the taste of her lips and the scent of her. No perfume, of course, that would be offensive to Allah, but a clean, soapy smell. She hadn't bathed in days, none of them had. How did she manage that? Feeling himself growing hard again, he shook off the memory. First rule of the game, never, ever fall for a mark. He wondered, though, how far it might have gone had they not been so rudely interrupted by Harry. What a self-righteous jackass. Something the man had said irked him in particular, though X could not precisely say why. Don't flatter yourself. Harry had said. He'd echoed Tracy's words. Just how long had he been watching us? X suddenly wondered. Spying on us.